Dovetails Demystified, a simple and complicated way of hand cutting dovetails. Presented by Worth the Effort Woodworking, where it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Dovetails are the most overhyped, overvalued, overdiscussed, overanalyzed, overscrutinized, overpublicized joint in the woodworking world. Yes, they are good for boxes, cases, cabinets, drawers, attaching tabletops, timber framing, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, they have many applications, but still, it is a stupid bleeping joint used because nails were too expensive. I mean, really? Our fascination with tight dovetails nowadays borders on psychotic. Up until recently, this was strictly an a utilitarian joint. Woodworkers a century ago thought it ugly. Because it is! You have a gorgeous board with smooth, sensuous curved grain. And then at the end of it, we stick fringe, harsh, straight lines jutting off in opposite directions. That's beautiful. That's organic. Any art student or design student will tell you there's seriously something wrong with sticking a dove jointed and grain joint out on the end of a board. Sure, we've tried dressing them up with different patterns, thin pins disguised in grain and such, but still, it's ugly. Throughout history, craftsmen have worked hard to conceal the dovetail. Moldings and furniture? What do you think's behind it? The dovetails are hiding. Ever notice how the only time you find exposed dovetails on a piece of furniture is when it's painted? Even look at the names we woodworkers give the joint. Half blind, because heaven forbid it show. Full blind, make god awful sure there is no hint of it. This was a purely utilitarian joint. I remember seeing a Woodwright show where Underhill was examining some Thomas Day furniture, the kind of furniture that costs more than your house. And at the back of the drawer, they were looking at the quality of the dovetails. And he pointed out the missing teeth. Because back then, if the tooth didn't fit, they just sawed it off with a hammer. And don't get me started on hand cut versus machine. The wood doesn't know, and the customers don't either. Having said all that, I like dovetails. I like the process of making them. They're a simple solution in this complex world. The act itself is analog. It's physical. It requires effort. Mind you, not a lot, but it's the kind of physical work that de de-stresses and helps reduce the pressure of the day. It requires just enough focus to push all your other problems to the background, letting them cool, abate, go away. Plus, it makes you feel better. It's an ego boost, even years later. Seeing that joint you made with just a piece of steel in your hand, goal in your mind, desire in your heart, and skill you learned over time. You put yourself into it. Is that the difference between a craftsman and an artisan? Being able to hand cut a dovetail is a self-centered, self-indulgent luxury to the soul. And showing that off to the world is purely an ego boost. Still, I like making them. In this video, I'll cover how I teach people to cut their first dovetails. You know the one that's supposedly going to go horribly wrong? They say every dovetailer has a hundred bad dovetails in their lifetime. You might as well get them all the way at the beginning. Then we'll add some complexity to the mix to make it easier as I explain why my method is wrong and how you should be cutting them. Along the way, I'll cover the tools you'll need, those you'll want, and if time allows, I'll show you a few fixes. So, let's get started cutting dovetails. Okay, as I said earlier, I'm just going to blast through my first joint, showing you how I kind of teach people starting out how to do them. And this also makes a pretty good warm-up because there aren't very many tools available. Uh, and then later on, I'll do a little bit more, add a little bit more complexity to make it easier, probably a little bit more accurate for some people. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to film this straight through non-stop. I'll try, try and go back and film some explanations. Uh, some close up, and I'll either put them up in the corner as an inset or something like that. But I'm probably I'm going to try and do this non stop and just go straight through. Right now, I have two three quarter inch boards. The tools I'm going to be using is a simple mallet, a marking knife, chisel, a decent uh, dovetailing saw, and a coping saw. Uh, some people prefer using a pencil, but I prefer a knife. 
not for snobbery or anything like that. It's just that uh, poor eyesight, I can actually feel the indentation with both my saw and fingernail. I use it all the time. I'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, we, won't, we won't be doing much measuring at all on this. Uh, we will be using physics, gravity, and all that kind of stuff. Too. A little bit of geometry to make it work. So I have two boards. I'm going to make a joint like this. Always, always, always lay your box out before you join the corners and label them so that you make sure that the joint goes in the right direction. It's going to go back together at the same time. Uh, now I'm going to make my baseline. So I'm going to grab my knife, lay one of the bevels down with the angle leaning away from me or towards me, uh, and uh, just drag the board across, making a knife line. What's nice about this technique is it will compensate for uh, different size boards automatically. You won't have to think about it. Uh, mark one board, the two faces, and the other board, you want to mark all the way around. The one you mark all the way around is going to be your tail board, and you need those side marks to help you cut perpendicular across, cut the sides of the tails off. Okay, so we're going around. Now some people will scoff at this technique using a chisel this way because I guess technically the bevel on the line you are making is the wrong direction. The bevel is facing your safe side of the wood and generally you want the bevel to face your waist side so the saw falls right against the knife line by going into the V. But we're using this as a baseline, not as a sawing line that much. So there you go. So I have my two baselines. I take the one that's all the way marked all the way around. Uh, make sure I am going to be sawing into the face side of the board. I'll go ahead and mark the face. You always want to saw into the face side because you're going to get a little spelching from the saw on the back side. And that side will be buried in the joint, so nobody cares about seeing that one. So I line it up, I step back, I make sure visually it is going straight up and down. We as human beings are actually very good at determining uh, vertical stuff because otherwise we would be falling down left and right. Okay, I'm going to eyeball over about a quarter of an inch. You could probably grab your half inch chisel and take half that distance. I'm going to make a little notch on the far corner. Then I'm going to use my dominant eye. This is my dominant eye looking down this side of the saw plate getting it perpendicular by balancing it, making the height, the weight of the back saw just bounce right there. And then I can pivot the saw until the line is straight across, and that will give me my 90 degrees. Saw down, I set the teeth in the wood and I let the saw plate fall over and it will wedge against the bottom and the top. You have set on your saw teeth, means the saw plate is thinner than the saw teeth, and that allows a little clearance in the saw plate. It's in the far corner, looking in the mirror, letting it fall, and that clearance allows it to rest on one corner at a certain angle and a certain depth. And this will give you a fairly consistent angle when you're sawing. Stop at your baseline, go to the middle, then maybe a quarter of an inch over, Looking at the reflection, saw straight across. Now I tend to start on the far corner and come across. Force of habit, I think it's a good method. I know some people that are fully capable of just laying the saw flat on the top of the board and sawing straight across. I have a hard time with that because A, your teeth are in the wood and they act like soccer plates and soccer fields are really grip as they bite in. And B, it means you're having to follow two lines at once when you are following a line. And I'm just not that coordinated. Some people are more than capable of walking, talking, chewing gum, and juggling wet cats at the same time. That ain't me. Using a coping saw to get rid of the waste. I know a lot of people will take two cuts. I just like to go right above the baseline and come straight across. I use a set of the teeth to turn the corner. I'll talk about that later. You got that down. Now this is the first time I'm actually going to have to follow a line as I saw. So I'm going to use my finger as a guide. And on this side, I'm going to use the pressure, the fat of my finger, as a micro adjuster. The more I squeeze the board, the more it will move over. I might have a little off of that practice. Cut, but this is the first cut of the day, so I'm just kind of warming up. And this is a great warm-up, just to get your hands loosened up, your eyeball tracking straight. 
See on this side, I'm going to drop my finger down to that knife line, which leaves a perfect finish. Can't get more accurate than that. You sacrifice a little bit of your manicure, but yeah, I don't care. Okay, Oops, not quite all the way down. There we go. If you've got any schmutz in the corner, now's the time to get rid of it. Okay, now we're going to chisel out the waist. And I choose a little half. Basically, you go halfway to the, your line, your baseline, and go halfway deep. This allows the chisel to track better once you get right on that baseline and go straight down. Otherwise, there's so much resistance on both sides of the chisel because of the wedge action, it will actually force the chisel back past your line. If you keep doing half one side or the other until you can't take half anymore and it just drops into that knife line, well, you have basically air on one side of the chisel, which has very little resistance, and your chisel should go straight down. I also go halfway, because like if I get any kind of blowout due to my chisel being, uh, I don't know, dull, uh, it'll happen in the middle and not on one of the edges that I'll show corner and you will be the only person that's embarrassed knowing that there's blowout inside the middle of the wood because most of your customers do not have x-ray vision. Clean out any waste. Do not chisel a piece of board in your hand. That's just absolutely stupid. You are asking to cut yourself. Students never do this. And yet I just recorded it for posterity. Okay, now I've got to transfer the lines. I come over, I find my A that I marked, which I just cut off, but I got my face side, and find the A on the other side, and I'm going to transfer these, re-putting that A on, transfer these to my vise, like so. And you feel stupid doing this, but I guarantee if you don't do this, eventually you will mark your tails backwards on one of your four corners, and the whole box or the cabinet won't go together. Now these little twin screw vices I build, I make out of the 2x12, so I have a pretty good platform on the back to rest it on. And the key thing when you're transferring lines is that this back piece cannot move. One of the advantages of using a pencil is you can't erase the line. If you're using a knife and it moves, you're just pretty much screwed. Okay, using very, very, very light cuts. You don't want the bevel to wedge into the board and move your tailboard. I'm coming across three, four, five, twenty times to make a deep enough cut that I can see. That's all I'm worried about is seeing it and being able to feel it because I'm using my knife. Lift it up. And that's actually the first time we've done any kind of measuring where it had to be dead on perfect accurate. And that's the only time. Okay, come back over here. Step back, visually look chip. Make sure it's straight up and down. There we go. Come back owner. I'm going to take out the waist, so I'm going to use the fat of my finger this time as a fence. Move it straight over. Get right on that edge. Try and take half the line. Nickel my way across the top, just enough to barely to set the teeth. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to try and find the balance point with a heavy back saw up top. And that is 90 degrees if you've got this board straight. Once I find that, just try and lock that angle in and come straight down. Okay, fingernail in the knife line on this side. Gives me a really tight joint. Come back in, find my balance point, straight down. Okay, fatty flesh as a micro adjuster, nibble my way across the top line, find my balance point, very light, grip on the handle, come back in, in the final corner, fingernail in the knife line, nibble my way across, I'm probably going to be a little loose on this one, oh well, straight down, Come back over. Okay, this time I go take the saw down to the baseline. I put extreme pressure sideways. Let the teeth of the saw kind of form a little ledge 
And now as I rotate it over, my pressure is straight up and then just straight across from the baseline. I tend to stay slightly above the baseline and chisel my waist. I know some people are good enough that they go straight to the baseline and don't ever worry about it. That's not me. I don't even try. I'm not that brave. Come back over. Once again, students, put something underneath this. Don't chisel into my benches, please. Go half the line, or if you don't have very much wood there, you can go straight to your baseline. Chisel halfway down. You'll get a feel for how much wood can be there and how much not, depending upon the species. I like to teach with poplar because it's so soft, it demands that the, ch the students sharpen their tools a lot. Sharpening is the big lesson I have here. Sharp tool is a safe tool. You can do much more with a sharp tool. But there we go. Softer woods like poplar are not very forgiving for dull tools. But they are forgiving for joinery because they're a little bit more compression in the wood. So you can sneak a tighter fit if you need to. Which is why professionals use one soft wood and one very hard wood in their dovetailing demos. It's a bit of a cheat. I have yet to see somebody try to dovetail two pieces of purple heart in a live demo. That would be kind of impressive. Halfway, halfway, chisel is a two-handed tool, get rid of any smuts, do not use your uh, chisel in your hand. I do like to use my marking knife if my dovetail is big enough. I like that secondary bevel, it just makes things a little bit easier. Right? A lot of people don't use that secondary bevel, but it does fit in there very nicely. You can actually make a shearing cut with it. There we go. Okay, grab a metal hammer. Make sure everything is lined up. Bases are outside. Now on a dovetail, when you assemble, you do want to make sure you assemble straight 90 degrees because there's some torque adjustment on there. A dovetail is only weak in this one angle, but if you add any kind of angle here, some torque on the side, it will bite and it will hold. Ooh, this one might be a bit tight. We'll just grab that hammer and find out. You hear the sound difference? This side is a lot tighter than the other side, so I better make sure I'm at 90 degrees when I hammer it. Looking for any practice. And there we go. Nice practice dovetail for you. Now let's make, add some complexity to do it to make it easier. Okay, that was a down and dirty dovetail. Very minimum tools, very little measuring, just a little bit of physics and geometry in it. So let's add a little complication, a little sophistication make, to make it a little easier, theoretically a little bit more accurate. So real quick, I'm gonna go over some of the tools that you may want, you might not need, but you may want to get. Uh, and then after that, I will cut another dovetail using these tools, but I'm going to do a jump cut filming so that it'll be a little bit shorter. So let's start out with, most everyone's going to want a dovetail saw. Now, if you're just starting out, don't buy a dovetail saw first. Go ahead and get a carcass saw, something a little bit bigger, a little more general purpose one. A, the, the blade's going to be thicker, you're not going to just destroy it right off the bat. B, it's a lot more flexible. You can do nice 10 inch, you can do a lot more work with one of these, and if you're just learning, you don't know which direction you're going to go. This will be useful in all different types of woodworking, where dovetail joints, they kind of are a specialty tool. So save your money right off the get-go and buy a little bit more of a general purpose saw, and for learning, you can actually cut dovetails with a panel saw. Uh, it'll get you learning, uh, but a carcass saw will be just fine. And don't be afraid of the Japanese saws. Well, I don't prefer them anymore. I started out with these because I, I bought into a lot of the hype. Uh, for the style I work, I like, I like the English style because I'm more standing up a lot, more going into the vise. But these, these are easy to sharpen because you don't. You replace the blades. For most of the ones that we can afford to purchase in this country, you can buy resharpable ones, but they're generally kind of pricey. 
uh, they work just fine. I, I have nothing against them in their applications where I'll pull this thing out to use it, but for dovetailing, uh, I prefer the English style. Uh, the kind I used in the video was a jet style, which means it had a straight handle, and I bought these for the school because the kids seemed to work them a little bit better, and I, I just got accustomed to it. A lot of people will prefer more of a pistol grip style, like this. And these have their advantages, especially if you're doing a lot of work. Uh, they're generally a little bit heavier than the, the, the uh, straight handles, but because of the shape of the handle, if you squeeze with your middle finger, it will pivot off this bottom to very lightly lift up the front to make it easier to start. And if you want to get some power stroke, you just squeeze with your bottom two fingers and it will press down a little bit and give you a little bit more power. The, the handle design of the thing, these things are incredibly sophisticated for their work. So get a good one. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money on them, uh, but generally you want one uh, about 16 to 20 teeth per inch. The higher the number, the thinner the board it can do. But the thinner, the higher the number, it just takes longer to do the thicker boards. Hey, it's a hobby, you're not going for speed. Uh, if you're doing them all days, you will like a pistol grip. Okay, and next kind of saw, coping saw, these are the bane of my existence. Uh, they're $8 to $12. You can improve these by, before you put the blade in, stretching them out to get a little bit more tension. And also you can put little lock washers on either end over here to lock them in. Uh, they'll work okay. Uh, they're just cheap little saws. They get the work done. These are not precision devices. All I use them for is getting out waste in dovetails. I can't think of another application I actually use this kind of saw for. Okay, next up is your chisels. For the longest time, I used the typical blue handle chisels. Uh, they're great, and until I used another one, I had no complaints whatsoever. The one complaint I do have now is that the angle on the side right here is fairly thick, so when you go into corners, you're always gonna get a little notch in the corner, and you can tell people have these kind of chisels. These are a little bit more general purpose chisels, especially the ones you buy at Home Depot and stuff. Look at those side bolsters, and not only do they taper bigger, but they're really thick. It allows a lot of strength in them. You can really leverage against them. Where the chisels I recently purchased for the school, are more of a classic bevel edge where they're very thin on the side and they are uniform all the way down so you can slide them into a small gap and it's not going to spread out. Uh, I just find that design a lot nicer for dovetailing. It's a little bit more flimsy but you would never notice that difference unless you used them back to back with something like a firmware chisels or those heavy bolstered side chisels. Okay, just get a good chisel. Speaking of chisels, you're going to want to sharpen these things a lot especially if you're using American hardwoods uh, like oaks and stuff, because the, the edges will crumble. So make yourself a stroke. You can resharpen it right on the bench. You don't have to go to your stone. Just keep every every few dovetails, rehone it, get your new edge, and you maintain an edge will last longer than having to rebuild it a crumbled edge. Works great. Get yourself a stroke. Uh, we do sell sell something like this online in our store. If we don't now, it will be in the future. Uh, uh, next, you're going to mark your layouts. Now, at the top of the video, you saw me making a classic style uh, dovetail gauge, dovetail template, dovetail marker, however you want to call it. Uh, I'll show you how to use this one in the upcoming jump section. You can also buy other styles. This one, I'm going to drop a name here. These are Lee Valley ones. I like showing these because these are, from what I understand, the first product that Robin Lee made for a woodworking crowd. Still make them a little bit of a sturdy angle iron cut at certain degrees. Now, you'll find them set up, one's one in six, one's one in eight, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on that one. But supposedly they are for different styles of wood. The, the steeper angle is for softer woods because that is compressed, theoretically. Uh, so you want a steeper angle so it'll be less uh, uh, play in it when after it compresses. Where hardwoods can go with a more up and down angle because they're harder, they won't compress as much, and it looks better. I've read in uh, textbooks all through the 40s, 50s uh, research, and it seems to be this 1 in 8 for softwoods, 1 in 6 for hardwoods, the mantra's repeated, yet throughout history you see people breaking those rules and their products last two, 300 years. So take it with a grain of salt. The ones I design are 1 in 7, split the difference I thought, but actually a few years ago I cut a bunch of dovetails and cut the angles that I thought looked the best, they all work. 
but the look the best, and it came out about one inch seven. So I, I've just stuck with that one for all hard all woods. Now you have other styles though, which are kind of nice. This one is a wood one made by Frank Straza from up at Homestead Heritage, which is kind of nice of him, uh, which allows you to mark across the top and down the angles in one shot. Uh, you see the metal ones are made like these. Uh, one bad thing I think about the smaller ones is you can't gang cut things, you can't mark them all at once. Though some people have made other ones that are longer on top so you can mark across more boards. But these work great, they're kind of cool looking, they got a little sliding dovetails. It's a little bit of an ego boost every time you pick one up. Uh, if you use a kind that don't have a 90 degrees, you're going to need some way to mark 90 degrees. Uh, you can use a little four inch four square, you can use a big stair one style. I like getting one of these because if you ever make your pins proud, you can move that baseline down a little bit and mark all the way across the board with a bigger one. Uh, so they do that, kind of have their advantages, but don't be afraid of making your own. Uh, a couple takes a couple of hours with a little bit of scrap, make your own square. This will mark your baselines all day long. Mark straight across the top, make a smaller one if you want to. Uh, don't be afraid of making your own. Uh, and if you don't want to make your own, once again, we will have these available for sale on our website to help you support the school and pay the rent. Other ways of marking your baseline, the ones I prefer the most, uh, is using a, uh, a gauge. This one is a, has a cutter or a round one. It's a little bit more of a modern design. You have the square wood ones that work. When you're buying these, the one thing you want to watch out for is get one where the screw that attaches to the cutter is recessed. Because that's the only way you will be able to mark your depth by plunging it down on something. Most of the cheaper ones have just a normal screw that has a dome on it so that the cutting edge is not on the bottom. Also, I like to get the ones where the head is slightly recessed so when you bring it down it is nice and flush because this is the one tool I cut myself with the most. Because I'll drop it in a hole and if I leave it stuck up, my hand will rub against it and I'll, I'll nick myself. Uh, but I like these and I'll use it in the video to show you how uh, they work very well. Okay, other things you're going to need. You're going to need a mallet. Uh, I prefer these carving style mallets mainly because I can hold it three different ways. Uh, you can hold it right here for your chopping out of dovetails or carving. If you're doing leather carving you need fine things. You can actually use the dome aspect to touch it. The dome actually just keeps it flat. And if you're mortising you can do heavy stripes. Don't worry about it being rounded and deflecting off. That has never been an issue with me. Other people prefer a, typical, a more traditional joinery mallet where you have a nice flat face on it. And you can make one of these, you can buy one. Uh, I always suggest making it just because it's a good exercise for newbie woodworkers. Uh, these are typically a little bit heavier though. And uh, I use mine for uh, mortising. Uh, you also want to get a small metal hat man because as you saw in the other video the metal will allow you to hear the tension in the pins as it goes down so you can find uh, correct the problem before it really makes things bad. Now if you're interested in learning more about these details of setting them up and you are local, Graham Blackburn, the woodworking writer and the guy that had that TV show, he's coming in at the end of April and he's going to do a long weekend section on just dovetails and I'm really excited because he's going to I know he's going to be able to explain more details of all these tools I've just shown you and how to tune them, how to sharpen them. I mean, he has literally written the encyclopedia of woodworking tools. In addition to talking about all the other traditional hand tool books and he wrote an entire book on woodworking techniques. This is from a guy that's on the bestseller list for fiction writing from what I and so you know he's going to be able to spend a good yarn, especially understanding that he had a TV show where he would actually interview some of the best woodworkers out there, like Maloof and all of them. So it's going to be a great weekend. It's a weekend on just dovetailing. So it's pure exercises, uh, no time spent on just mundane stuff like sanding a project. I mean, dovetail, 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 all different types of dovetails. So I'm pretty excited about that. So if you're local, you can come to that. The last tool you're going to need is some way to hold the wood. You saw me using one of the twin screws we have at the school that we also offer for sale on the website. Uh, you can also use a leg vise or one of the metal machinist vise with a little leather or wood as a clamp. I know a lot of people that do dovetails using just this typical uh, old style wooden hand screw. And what's cool about those is you can dovetail a huge piece of wood by just putting clamps on both sides of them. That works absolutely great and requires nothing but a flat surface 
to clamp that clamp down onto you. You have to clamp the clamp. Okay, so those are some of my accessory tools. Now I'm going to build um, cut another dovetail using these more sophisticated tools to show you how they work. I'm going to do a cut session, trying to keep it down short, and then we'll go from there. In order to save a little money, I'm going to reuse the piece I dovetailed earlier, and it'll give me a good chance to show you the proper way to take apart a dovetail. I see a lot of students, they do great work, they get everything done up, and then they take it apart by wiggling it back and forth, and every time you change this 90 degree angle, you are loosening up your joint. So your objective is to actually pull this straight up so that you don't torque on the edges. Uh, the easiest way I know to do that one is I will lift the edge of my board up about an inch. I'll make sure that I'm working on the tail section about the thickness of the board and then I'll just lightly tap here. Notice I'm starting out holding it at an angle, a slight angle and just a light tap. And the idea is I'm trying to prevent this 90 degree angle from changing and by having this on the board the force is tilting it down. And there we go. And it doesn't look like you've got any blowout on the edges or stuff like that. So, I'm real quickly going to relabel these B and B so I get the right corners and still use the same faces. I don't know why. Okay, our first step is to lay out the bottom so we'll use a gauge this time. So this time we're going to be using a wheel gauge. This one has a recess on the screw so that we can reference one board off of the other. So I can come over here and just real quickly bottom out the top and this style screw generally has two locks. I'm going to lock the head and then you have a collar side on the side that you have to lock that. Then you can loosen the head up and it will twist on the shaft and that will allow you to do a micro adjuster. I like to do mine just a tad bit proud whenever I make dovetails simply because I find it easier to shave down the ends than shave the whole side uh, if it's a little bit short. So lock that down. Okay, then we got our tailboard, and the typical technique is that you can either put it on the table or most of the time I just register against my body. I make sure that this is flat against it. All my force is going this way, and then I roll my weight around the top, dragging towards myself. Personally, I have a hard time pushing and doing the, all this at once. So pull towards yourself. And this uses a wheel color. You can resharpen them, though I only sharpen mine once maybe a year, and a thousand grit is probably too high. You actually do, don't want them too razor sharp, especially if you're going with the grain at any. There we go, there's one side, and the other one, I'm just going to do the two faces. Because I don't need to mark the sides, I'm not going to be sawing them off. So that's how you mark the bases with a gauge. Next step, we're going to mark out the layout because we're doing it the sophisticated way. We could actually grab a ruler and grab a pencil and do your actual layout lines with a bunch of math and all that kind of stuff. But I, I'm math in my head, yeah, it's not going to happen. So, uh, this is a tool that uh, Megan Fitzpatrick reminded me to include. Now, I forgot to talk about it, but it is a, a compass and people lay them out all the time. Uh, excuse me, a divider. Now, this one is a speed retractor. Uh, you need to watch out though. Do not over tighten it this way. These are brass and they're easy to strip out because basically it comes out and then you can rotate it and slide it backward and forward and this collet is what anchors those screws. But because it's a speed it doesn't have screw all the way through so I have a lot of students that will take these and they think that they're tightening it up and just crank on it and you just strip out the screws. So you have to be, a, these are, I'm not going to call them delicate but you just have to work with them a little bit. I want to do a two sided, I mean a two tailed a dovetail and I'm going to measure out the tails but you can use the same technique for if you do pins first so basically the idea is if I want to stop my pins at say this tails around that area I'm going to step it out one two for the second one and this error right here is twice my error on steps so because it's only two that the math is easy I'm just going to do half the distance then register against the edge one two, half that distance, one, two, I'm right there. So that is going to be the sides of two of my tails. 
So I go ahead and indentation of it, indentation of it. Now I can come back and register this side, indentation, indentation. And what's nice about this technique, I want you to notice, is the distance between the sides and the middle. This distance here, here, and here, which is going to be the size of our pins, are all equal. Uh, and this technique works with three pins, four pins, five pins. It's all the same. You just kind of pick the distance you want between your pins on this side, measure it out, and then measure it back the other way. Next up, we're going to mark our 90 degrees, and instead of doing the reflection trick, we're going to actually use a gauge. This gauge right here I made earlier in the video it has basically 90 degrees here as one of my gauges, and this distance from this fence over the edge is over an inch and a half. So if you're working with three quarter inch wood, it will go, it will gang measure two boards, which is what I do a lot of times. So here we go. I come over, I find the side, I drop my knife into that hole I created with the dividers, bring the, the gauge up, and mark straight across. Now a lot of people are, are worried about cutting into a wood template like this, and I say, who cares? You can always make another one. But if you are, as long as you keep this tip below the level of the wood, you can't cut into it. Uh, there's no way, uh, unless you physically force it by twisting it. So I keep the blade flat against the edge and that tip below, and it, wh whether it's a wood uh, square or whatever, it all will be fine. Slide it in, measure the other side, and because it's 90 degrees, both sides will be equal. Uh, the gauge uh, is parallel at about an inch and a half also. So there we go. We have our marked gauges. Next up we want to mark our levels down. Because I used a knife, I can slide my knife in. And I'm going to mark it on this side for the video. But understand I'm about to cut and mark this side so that I can see it. So I line, up, line my knife up and the other side has corresponding angles so that I can get a left and a right angle. So there we go. I come over, I slide the knife in to my old line, slide that up, go to the baseline, and I pull towards myself. Whenever I do the this side, you can see, I slide my knife in, I typically go down. You want to do a light cut because you're going with the grain and the blade will tend to follow the grain, so make multiple passes. So, that's how you mark it out, using a traditional marking gauge. Next up is the sawing, and nothing's really different, but I am going to make sure that I saw on my waist side of the line, and because I, I have a knife line there, it should be easier for me to follow, technically. Now, nothing's different, I'm going to slide my fingernail in there, and then use a pad of my finger on the, finger on the other side, so I'm going to go fast forward through this so you, can, you don't have to listen to me. Now I will say this, following the lines now is not that critical as long as you get 90 degrees straight across the top. But it is good practice for when you do your pins to get split that line right in half. So that is what you're doing. You are practicing on this first cut. If you cut pins first, it's still practice as long as you get the 90 degrees straight down. The angle doesn't really matter that much. But you want to practice splitting that line if at all possible. Chopping is the same. I use a rule of halves. So you're still going to go straight down, but you do, if you, at all possible, want to stand to the side of the chisel. Don't chop this way or face on, simply because it's much easier to determine straight up and down vertical when you're standing to the side. If you notice, I am also on the very last one, angling in ever so slightly. 
Now transfer the lines, and this time I am going to try to use a sharp pencil, but you're going to see one of the downsides of using a pencil in a second. Notice these pins are, I mean, these tails are not that tight, I mean, uh, narrow. So I'm going to transfer these over, once again using the trick where you kind of put it the way it's going to be when you transfer it over. Pardon me while I work around this camera when I do this, I might bump it. Get it flush. Lay your work down right on top of it. Get sure, make sure it's even. If you have a knife, you can actually register the knife against one board and use it as a fence to bring the other board up to it. Right on and hold down very hard. Now, you see the pencil line right there. It's a very thin pencil line, but if you can see it, that means that part of the wood needs to come back up. So if we remove that pencil line, this joint will not fit. But for me to get the pencil line on the inside here, it is an awfully tight fit, and I'm very likely to mess up or move it. That is one of the reasons why knives, I think, work better is because they are so much narrower they can really get in there well hold it up to the side fly it up some people like these really thin knives so that they can have really thin pins but at a certain point I just think a knife gets too flexible I like it somewhat thick myself now it's just a matter of marking your 90 degrees straight down. Remember in this joint that 90 degrees is the most important part. Once again, I'm going to use my marking gauge and uh, this time I will use a pencil just to be different. Though I have a hard time with the pencils because I can't feel the line. In fact, I'm not going to use a pencil. Use a knife because I can't feel the line I cut. Of course, there is a line on this side because that's just pencil. And cut, mark your line straight down using the 90 degree reference on the tool you made. And we will be selling these tools fairly inexpensively just as a fundraiser for the school. Uh, the school opened up about nine months ago. So we're coming up on our sophomore year and everyone that knows startups understands that the sophomore year cash flow becomes critical. And we really don't need to make much to keep the doors open here, but we are struggling at the moment. So if you'd like to support the school, you just want to get something kind of cool, uh, we will be selling little markers like this online. Now I want you all to see something. I missed my line there. Don't freak out. Obviously I've exaggerated this. You can reset the line. Uh, if you got the line dead on in front, you can use your finger gauge over there to move it over to get right where you want and just slowly nibble until you get it just where you want it to be. Okay? The, another trick would be to turn your blade sideways and saw until you reach that point. Once you reach that point, put the toe of the saw in there, then realign the back and nibble your way across the top again. You might only be using the teeth on this side, the set of the saw on this side to make that cut, but you can easily correct a cut as long as you just don't keep going. Okay, so I'm coming down the face. I'm splitting the line now, you can see that. But I am going to purposely turn it sideways and screw up. Okay, you see I am off my line there. So there's no reason I can't come back up, reset, and then just slowly lower the saw, letting the set of the teeth recarve that line. And there you go, you can actually see the error and the correction on both sides. Error and correction on both cuts.
Okay, so here we go. I've got the original one that I just kind of hand did. The only real measurement I, what, that was there was when we transferred the angle. Everything else was not following a line. It was just trusting gravity, geometry, that kind of stuff. So once again, very low measurements. So let's try for the first time to see how the second one, where all the measurements went, goes together. And invariably, this one's going to be looser. Just for I don't know why. It's because I have to follow. You have to fo be more precise in, in following the lines this way. So let's hear it. And this one's going to be a bit tight. Might be a little bit too tight. Okay. So there we go. A little proud. But we can shave that off, okay? So, uh, I will say there's a little bit of a gap right there, so evidently I didn't follow the line coming straight down. So let's fix that gap. Okay, the gap I was talking about is right here. You can see I can fit my entire knife in there. If you're doing the hand tool Olympics, that would be probably three cards right there. And it's, it's tied up top and off down here, which means one of these two 90 degrees was off. I don't know which one. To fix that, though, I actually have to make it worse because I need an even gap to fill it. So I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to run it straight through that curve from corner to corner. And don't press down because the, the saw will just kind of go straight in. We want to actually remove wood. So I'm, I'm letting this, the teeth, see, it wants to fall in. Okay, so once I have an even gap all the way through, I now need to cut a shim to slide in there. Okay, cutting shims is great, great sawing practice because basically I need to cut a shim the thickness of the saw plate because the saw plate would fit down in that gap. So I'm going to come over and just very closely eyeball that thickness. And if you screw up, it doesn't matter. Just plane it smooth again and try again. Okay, very, very, just as thin as I can possibly make it. Again, this is just practice. So if you screw this up, no big deal. But this is something that anybody can learn to do. Cut a very thin shim. Okay, and it just broke off like that. Okay, fairly thin. So let's stick the old board back up and slide this in. Okay, so I have my shim here and I have that saw curve right there. This is the end grain of that shim. So I really want that to be down over here so that it will somewhat match up there. So about half the time I do this, I, I end up breaking it off. So if it does, it's no big deal, but it's just practicing. You're seeing how it's done. This might be a bit thick, so I'm going to go to my hand plane and shave it down a tad bit. So I've got my hand plane here. I'm just going to slide this and using my finger just shave it down until I get to the portion I want. Now it looks scary but it really isn't. You can't really cut yourself too badly doing this. It's kind of like shaving with a razor on your skin. The only difference is you are putting a little pressure down but just don't put too much down. Okay, here we go. Try to slide it in. You can see that the saw curve fits all the way through. It would probably be better to put a thicker saw curve, but that's what I'm working with. I'm going to very gently push it forward. Remember, it's at a 45, so you're going to have to slide it in. Work it down. Try not to break it. And in the end, you should have a fairly tight joint and then you can take the chisel and plane it down but remember I've got these set a little bit proud so I still have to sand them down to make them smooth but that'll fill the gap well there you go a little bit more precise way to cut a dovetail by hand is marking everything out and cutting to the line uh, I sanded this down here's a picture of the one I we just did can you see where the repair was 
Also, I have not glued this up because I'm about to destroy it in another example. Uh, but I want you to notice, sawdust will fill your gap. So we, if you wait to sand it smooth until after you glue it up, like maybe 10 minutes after you glue it up, the sawdust will mix with the glue and form it your own gap filler, so to speak. So that's one other way to fill the gaps. But what if the joint just is so gappy, it doesn't work at all, how can you fix that? Well, there is a way of doing that. Watch this. So I'm going to take this semi-tight joint. I mean, I can't really pull it apart now without really loosening it up. And we're going to increase the gap of all of it. Not just one of them, all of them. So I put in the saw. Go grab a very large tenon saw grip. Come over to the first gap. Saw through it. Second one, saw through it. Third one, saw through it. Fourth one, saw through it. Can't get more gappy than that, and look at how loose it is now. Let's make it even looser. Really mess this thing up, okay? Okay, that's, it's not even holding its own weight anymore. I pretty much destroyed it. If this is the kind of joint you're, you're making, don't worry, we can still fix it. Okay, so let's fix this sloppy thing. Yes, it is real sloppy. So the idea is we're going to position it the way we want. If you had a square or something like that, you could probably clamp it to the square and get it exactly the way you want. Uh, I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm going to grab a quarter inch bit. Quarter inch because that's a third of the length of the board kind of using that tenon rule. I'm going to position it right in the middle, eyeballing it, and screw through the first pin into the first tail. You don't have to go very far. Come over. Grab a quarter inch dowel. I'm gonna use a flush cut saw, but you can use a chisel or just any other saw. Drop that dowel in. Might have to pound it in. Flush cut it. If you were to glue that, it'd be even better. And this is actually something the Green and Green, Green Brothers did to a lot of their finger joints, because they didn't have them. And even with just one, it's gotten a lot tighter. Let's do the other side. Drill. Drill. Insert. A little glue would help there. Flush cut. And it ain't gonna be a pretty joint, but it will be a joint that holds its own weight. Well there you go, a beat up joint that will still work for a case, a drawer, or something like that. It holds its own weight. Good, solid construction even though it looks a little sloppy. So we learned two different ways of making dovetail joints today. A measured way and then kind of a winged way using geometry, gravity, and a little bit of physics. Uh, I tried to show you a couple ways to correct your errors, even if you totally blow one up. Uh, dovetailing is a very simple joint. It's something that anybody can do, and I encourage you to try it. I encourage you to try and make some of these tools. And if you don't want to make the tools, please go to our school uh, website and maybe purchase one to help support us. Uh, we are in our ninth month here. Uh, we are struggling. Uh, year two is going to be, like any startup, extremely cash, cash poor. So other ways you can support the school is come out and take a class. We have a lot of teen classes. Adults learn free in the teen classes. Uh, and if you aren't local, we have some weekend classes with people like Tom Fidgen, Bill Anderson, Shannon Rogers, Jeff Miller, Mary May, Eli Bizzari, and George Walker still scheduled for 2014. It's going to be an exciting year if we can survive. So we do appreciate your support. Please tell your friends, spread the video, check out our website, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. And remember, it is always worth the effort to learn, 
great and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.